To define what SIRS is, there should be a history of exposure, which would include, um, this is a case definition that's used by the doctors, presence of visible mold or detection of musty odors, or um, there's positive commercial testing that you had showing that your dwelling or place of work or wherever it is that you're testing does have uh, some microbial growth there that's abnormal. Then you should also have multiple symptoms with multiple systems, abnormal labs, and improvement with therapy. This is important to know what SIRS is not. So it's not just mold. It's not an infection from a mold or a fungus. So we don't use antifungals in this protocol. It's not dependent on the dose of exposure. So for someone who's really sensitive, if this piece of paper here came from a water damaged building, they could have a reaction to this piece of paper if you're that sick. Not everybody is that sensitive, but um, it's not like an allergy where it's like you reach a certain threshold and then your body starts to have these symptoms. You don't really need much to get it to trigger. And the sicker you get, the sicker you can become more quickly for certain cases. It's also, as I said, not an allergy response. Some patients can have allergy as well to molds and to some other items that are in a water damaged building, but this is not the same part of your immune system. So don't confuse those two. SIRS does not necessarily require exposure to toxic mold. Some people get confused by that. Um, like I said, there's lots of other things in the water damaged building besides just toxic mold. These biotoxins are produced by living organisms found in the water damaged building, lime, blue-green algae, and then the Fisteria and Ciguataria, which we talked about. They're called ionophoric because they're very, very small, and they can make little tunnels in your cell membrane like a pore to go in and out and they can allow actually things to go in and out of the cell they can also directly impact the dna within the cell and change how your body is expressing your dna that's a lot of big terminology what it means is the control center in your cell which is your dna is used to make protein in your body so that your body can function and do things the toxins can come in and directly impact the brain of your cell and make it alter the way it's responding to things. So the other thing that's important to understand about these is they don't like to be in the bloodstream very long. They like to go in the fat. They're fat soluble um, items. So in the membrane of your cell, there's a lot of fat in there, lipids. So they like to stay nestled in there, but they will, a little bit of them will come into the blood just a little bit. There's kind of like what we would call a concentration gradient. And so some of them come out and your body excretes them into the bile in your digestive tract. And if you were someone who could make an antibody to the toxin, um, then your body would have that toxin tagged. It would go into the bile and then your body would just excrete it through your stool. You'd have a bowel movement and it would go out. But when you have SIRS, the body excretes the toxin into the bile, but there's no antibody on it. So it gets reabsorbed back into your system, into the blood, and then it floats around and finds a new cell to find in. And some patients, as you're moving these toxins out and trying to bind them with cholesteramine and Wellcol, start to actually have weird symptoms because things are getting moved through and impacting and kind of recirculating a little bit. So we try to be gentle in how we do this, but just realize that that's actually what's happening inside your body as we're pulling the toxins out. So we have to be careful how we do it. So we were talking before about a person who doesn't have this condition, goes into a water damage building versus someone who does. So if somebody doesn't have SIRS, I want to explain to you what should happen in the body. When you are exposed to anything that's foreign in your body, typically what happens is your body creates inflammation right away it's a signal that your body uses. So inflammation can be helpful to your body to just signal there's a problem. Within about four days or so, four to seven days, your body will make an antibody to whatever is foreign in the body and be able to remove it eventually. So if you think of someone who has, say, the flu, they don't have any antibodies to it yet. They feel sick as a dog the first few days, and then the antibodies kick in and they're still struggling, and then 
maybe by day seven or so, they're feeling like they're getting over the flu. That's a good analogy to this. That's how the immune system should work. But in the person with SIRS, what happens is they don't really form those antibodies according to the research that Dr. Shoemaker has come across. They don't make the antibodies. So that inflammation, which is from a special system in the body called the innate immune system, that's different from the allergies. Just wanted to let you know that. Um, and it's different from the arm of the immune system that causes, that makes antibodies. It's called your innate immune system. Think of the flu when you get the body aches and chills. That's your innate immune system, okay? The innate immune system just continues to trigger. So imagine having the flu and you stay achy and your muscles are sore and you keep having a headache and you feel terrible and it's not going away and you already tried Tamiflu and nothing's working. Now you have a little bit of better understanding. Take that to a chronic level and now we're talking chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Chronic meaning it's lasting longer than just a little bit of time. Inflammation because it's from the innate immune system infl causing inflammation and it's a response syndrome. It's in response to whatever foreign is in you that your body has not been able to remove. The way I like to think of it, just so you have a visual, because a lot of people are visual learners, think of your body's production of an antibody as like a sniper. Antibody is made specifically for one target in your body. So your body makes a lot of different types of antibodies, but they're geared towards one thing. The innate immune inflammation is not so picky. Remember, it was the first thing that your body just triggers off. So I liken that to uh, like a machine gun. And the guy who's running the machine gun, he's blindfolded, he's just going. He's just, whatever he can hit, he's hoping to hit the enemy, but you know, if there's a little bit of collateral damage, he'll take it until the sniper comes in. If you have that in mind and you lose your sniper, this guy is hard to control because typically in a regular immune system, once the sniper comes on the scene, this guy says, okay, my job is done. I can go, I can go back and subside myself, you know, get out of the picture. So for people who have chronic inflammation, it's because the regulation of the inflammation has not kicked in. It's kind of like keeping the oven on and you never turn it off. And so everything that's inside there hasn't been, you know, the chef didn't come back on and come back and turn it off to take the finished product out. It just keeps cooking and burning and it's a disaster and then the fire starts and that's pretty much what's happening in the SIRS patient, just the chronic influence of this inflammation. And so um, the biotoxins will bind to an antigen presenting cell, it's a special name for a cell in the body that the body uses in the immune system. And that cell releases all kinds of this inflammation for the innate immune system. So you see those different terms there, some of the labs that we're getting are on that page there. And we can measure some of these things. There are some things we can't measure, but some that we can. And so we use whatever is available at this point to measure. So the general picture is the adaptive immune system, which is the antibody production, is not working properly, okay? That, react, that um, causes overactive innate immunity, which is that inflammation. Think of the chronic fire. When you have chronic inflammation in your body, the rest of your body starts acting kind of strange. It doesn't like the inflammation being there and it starts to mess with different body systems. Think of that multi-system, multi-symptom syndrome that we've been talking about. So dysregulation of multiple systems in the body over time. So think about autoimmunity, hormonal imbalances. I don't know if this is ringing a bell with anybody in here, but it's not just usually one thing. Fire doesn't care. It just keeps burning and going. And then this idea is very important. If you have an HLA susceptible individual, it takes a priming event like maybe an influenza or a Coxsackie virus or some other kind of insult to the body that triggers the immune system that then gets you to that place where your body will have uh, a, an overreaction with the innate immune system on exposure. 5% of patients 
don't have the susceptible genes but could still get SIRS. They respond quicker to the treatment. The next thing that we want to look at is the MSH. Um, right above, let's look at this first. See this oval right here? It's orange oval. It says VIP, MSH, AVP. Below AVP, could you write in something for me? Your doctor's probably going to call that ADH. We can explain that to you later, but it's mainly a hormone that's found in the part of your brain called the hypothalamus. MSH and VIP are also made in the hypothalamus. And um, they're very important in regulating other hormones in your body. And so when the biotoxins come in and start causing all the inflammation, they start to take out the central console, control system in the brain. They start to impact these regulating hormones. So um, they like to get at the regulation of the cell and the DNA, and they like to get at the regulation inside your brain that's regulating all the other hormones. So we are you know, talking about full dysregulation of the whole body system through not only the cellular level, but then also at a hormonal level. And importantly, the reduced MSH has a very big impact on many things. You see all these orange arrows coming out from that oval. Um, it can cause sleep disturbances, chronic pain, GI problems, um, so intestinal absorption issues, prolonged illnesses where everybody else is getting better from the sickness and you have it for two weeks. And then you think you're out of it and now you've got another one for two weeks and then it just keeps coming back at you and you can't seem to shake things. Um, another one that it impacts is changes in cortisol and ACTH levels. This is your adrenal function here. And oftentimes what we see um, in SIRS patients is they can have really wacky ACTH levels and AM cortisol levels that can either be both really, really high or really, really low or one's really high and one's really low. And it's just showing that it's not regulating properly properly and once we get the biotoxin illness better controlled a lot of these hormonal things can can level out a little bit also um, over on the right here it says reduced androgens and so the msh can actually cause a lowering of some of the sex hormones um, including the testosterone and so we have to be monitoring those things as well I wanted to make a point, and if you could all write this down, this is very important to remember. You should never take testosterone replacement hormone if you have this condition. Because what will happen is this testosterone, your body will take that and it will convert it to female hormones right away, really quickly, faster than it should. Typically your body might do a little bit of that, but an enzyme called aromatase is overactive in most SIRS patients and it takes that testosterone and makes it go to the female hormones. So your doctor will think, oh, you felt better for a little bit, but then you got worse. I got to give you some more male testosterone hormone. And now you keep getting ramped up and you're feeling worse. And it's because you're not actually maintaining that male hormone. You're getting female hormones instead. The other thing I want to point out is with regard to um, steroids. We were talking about ACTH and the adrenals. You never want to take oral steroids or IV steroids, if at all possible, unless it's, unless it's like a life-threatening event, because that will shut down, that could shut down your adrenal access for a SIRS patient, and it could be really hard to regain that back. So be very careful with that. Also, um, the chronic pain. Uh, I wanted to mention this because some patients will tell me, when I have a water damage building exposure, I get that chronic pain back. And it's just indicative that the MSH levels are probably being affected and, and probably some of the inflammation as well. And as the biotoxin illness protocol is followed, a lot of patients' chronic pain improves. And, and maybe it's kind of a thing where it's not at the forefront of their brain anymore. It's not signaling to the same intensity that it once was. And so maybe they still have that arthritis in their knee. It's still there. But the signal isn't as predominantly going to their brain because they're able to manage it. Their body's able to produce endorphins 
Think of an endorphin as like the feel-good thing when you go for a run. You have serotonin release, you have endorphins too. And so people like to exercise because they get these feel-good hormones releasing. Endorphin actually helps with pain. So that's why they instruct patients who have chronic pain to try to get some regular exercise to get an endorphin release. Well, when you have low MSH, your body is not going to be as good at releasing these endorphins. And it's because the cytokines block the leptin receptor at the hypothalamus level, and that block makes it very difficult then for your body to signal to make endorphins. Does everybody follow that? It's kind of like a chain event. So if you block the receptor that's going to produce the endorphins with the inflammation, then we're in trouble. So we have the genetic susceptibility testing. Then we have the regulatory hypothalamic hormones. If you remember on that um, slide or the paper that I showed you, the oval that had the hypothalamus, um, that had the VIP, MSH, and the AVP in it, has these two hormones made in the brain, in the central control part of your brain, called the hypothalamus, and those can get dysregulated. So I've seen patients have really low MSH. Most patients actually do. Unfortunately, that one so far, we don't have a treatment for that, and it typically stays low. Um, the VIP, we do have a treatment for, and we can see that improve, and that really does help the overall function of the patient. We also have a Marcon's nasal culture, which we do that um, is sent out to a lab, and specifically it's checking for really slow-growing organisms called coagulase-negative staph. And the ones that we're looking for are ones that are resistant to a lot of antibiotics. And this may be pertinent to some of you in the room, but some patients who have been on chronic Lyme treatment, lots of antibiotics, they may have a really hard time getting rid of the Marcons because they usually have a lot more resistances because of the antibiotic exposures. So it still can be treatable, but it, just for you to know that that can be more resistant prone. Um, not everybody has Marcons, but Marcons can be um, something that can be a problem for SIRS patients because the Marcons, which are these coagulase negative staph organisms, can set up shop in the nasal cavity really deep and they make this biofilm, which is kind of like a protecting coating so that your immune system can't penetrate it. And it starts producing all kinds of toxins and other types of molecules that affect your DNA expression. They also can split apart your MSH molecules, so now your MSH goes even lower. And they can do several other things as well, um, including affecting your immune system regulation. So we need to get rid of the Marcons if the Marcons are there. Um, and we usually use a nasal spray for that. Um, the next thing that we've already talked about is the ADH and serum osmolality salt regulation. And then we have the ACTH AM cortisol, which we talked about, which is the adrenal function. We, we measure that. TGF beta 1 and CD4, CD25 T regulatory cells are um, tests that we measure, and the TGF beta 1 I did mention briefly before can cause problems with the tight junctions in the brain, causing kind of a leaky brain, if you will, um, but it can also cause problems at the level of the lung where it causes stiffening through changing the, um, the cells from really soft, pliable cells to stiff cells. So the TGF beta 1 causes transformation of cell types into stiffening and it can cause shortness of breath, breathing issues, pulmonary hypertension which means um, it's so stiff that your heart is having a hard time even getting the blood to go through the lungs to get the oxygen into the blood. So the TGF beta 1 is something that we do not want to see elevated. I've seen some patients with like 15,000. It's supposed to be you know below 3,000 ish and those people have symptoms, and I've seen those come down and their breathing gets better. So I have seen it clinically correlate, which is really nice for the patient. Um, another one that we have is C4A, and we talked about that being the complement cascade with those little preformed packets that break apart, causing more inflammation. C4A can cause some patients to have cognitive dysfunction. That's one of the biggest ones, so difficulty with memory. 
We also have the VEGF, which is another one that deals with perfusion at the level of the capillary. If your VEGF is too low, you'll have hypoperfusion. So it'll affect possibly uh, your ability for cognitive function as well as breathing and just cellular oxygenation. MMP9, we talked about too. That was the drill I told you about, um, drilling into the lining of the blood vessel, allowing more inflammation in. This one is turning out to be a very um, important marker because it's been shown that uh, Dr. Shoemaker kind of says, says that it's kind of a marker of overall inflammation. So when someone has really high MMP9, they're really inflamed. Not everybody has high M MMP9, but the ones that do, they, they tend to be a little bit sicker from what I've seen. Leptin, we talked about, um, low versus high levels, and we check that. The testosterone, androstenedione, THEAS, estradiol, those are the sex hormones, and we mentioned not taking the testosterone um, replacement therapy. We talked about the autoimmunity with the anagliadin and anticardiolipin antibodies. And then there's some other labs that we check to rule out other things like thyroid and hemoglobin problems with anemias and um, things of that nature. So here is the protocol that Dr. Shoemaker came up with through all of his experiences with the biotoxin illnesses we talked about at the beginning. And this is in a very simplistic form, but typically what we do is we start at the bottom and we move our way up, usually without skipping any steps. Some steps are not necessary for all patients. For instance, not everybody has Marcon's, so that step could be skipped. What we can't skip is step one, because you have to get out of exposure. If patients are in exposure and we can't take them out of exposure, we do the best next thing and we try to keep removing the toxins with colsteramine and or well call. However, if you think of it as like a bathtub getting filled at a tap and all the toxins are coming in, the well call and the cholesteramine are like the drain. The drain can only do so much. And so you're, you, may, you might be maintaining, but you're not making any headway. So the best case scenario is removal from exposure, including cross-contaminated items, then uh, starting the cholesteramine well call. And you may do those in concert. You don't have to wait to get out of exposure before you start the binder. You can do those two together. But step three, eradicating Marcon's, makes no logical sense if you're living in a water damaged building because you're just going to keep breathing in possible Marcon's. So we have to get you out of that before we can treat the Marcon's. The next step would be anti-gliadin correction. That would be the gluten issue. We would do a trial of a gluten-free diet for a few months and then recheck, recheck labs and go from there. A lot of patients say, you know what, Dr. Barry, I just want to stay gluten-free. I don't even like the idea of eating gluten because of the immune system issues it brings anyway. And then we can skip that step, and, and then we move on. The next one would be correction of androgens, which would be the hormonal re-regulation of the sex hormones. Not everybody has that problem, but if it's there, we need to do it at that stage. Then a correction of the ADH osmolality, that's the salt rebalancing with either the nasal spray that I told you about, the DDAVP nasal spray, or the pill that they use in children who have the bedwetting issue. And um, a lot of patients, by the time they get to this level, um, do really well on that treatment. The next would be correcting the MMP9. That involves uh, high-dose fish oil and a low amylose diet. Um, it's essentially like a low glycemic index diet, but a little bit different, and it removes any foods that have a decent level of amylose in them. Amylose is a sugar that's in a lot of root vegetables. Um, it's in a lot of other foods like bananas. So um, that would be something in conjunction with the fish oil. Also, low VEGF is treated with the same thing, so we kind of get two for one with the high-dose fish oil and the low amylose diet. And just to let you know, some patients also require the high-dose fish oil and the low amylose diet when they start cholesteramine, prior to starting the cholesteramine. In particular, if you have a history of Lyme or suspicion of Lyme, we would do that because Lyme tends to 
in SIRS patients when they start the cholesteramine, it tends to cause the MMP9 to fly really high and they feel sick. And it's not a Herxheimer reaction because we're not killing anything off. It's what we call an intensification reaction from inflammation. And as we go up, then we have the C3A, the C4A, and the TGF beta 1, and each one of them have their own steps. Um, for the sake of time, I think I'm going to just jump to the VIP because that's like one that everybody wants to hear about. The VIP is a compounded nasal spray that Dr. Shoemaker had formulated for some of his patients because he found they had v low VIP and he knew he couldn't give them MSH. And he's had a lot of success with patients going on this. Um, I wouldn't say that it's a cure, but it definitely helps to manage the illness. And it makes you be able to dampen things down more quickly with the inflammation. However, it does not work well, and it's not advised to even prescribe, if you're still living in a water damaged building, if you have a failing VCS test, if you have elevated lipase, which is something we would screen for, for these various things, then you wouldn't be a candidate at that point, or if you have positive Marcons. This is really important. I think where most people fail this protocol is step one. Step one, what you're gonna see on the pyramid is removal from exposure. And because 50% of buildings, according to NIOSH, have water damage, it can be a challenge. Also, let's say you moved from a water damaged building and you thought everything was great, but you took some contaminated stuff with you. You just brought all the inflammagens and nasty stuff in a water damaged building to your new environment. And so it's, it's hard to leave the trail, if you will. You have to be very careful. One of the tests that your doctor will usually order for you to get is called an ERMI test. It's done through a company called Mycometrics. They mail the test kit to you, and your doctor will explain to you what to do with the t test kit, but it's a little Swiffer cloth, and um, you're gonna take a sample, typically, of your main living room, not your kitchen, because there could be contaminants in there just from food that we don't want to confound. Um, so your main living area and your, probably your master bedroom. When the EPA did this testing with ERMI, those were the two places they checked. They actually used a vacuum sample, just so you're aware of this, um, but we use a Swiffer cloth because there's, uh, due to some research things that they've come across, it seems a little more reliable for SIRS patients and the data we're trying to get. And the ERMI costs around $300, so it's not a cheap test, but it gives a lot of information. It only gives data, however, on mold. It doesn't give bacteria or toxins. But what it does give is information about two different categories of molds. Molds that are typically found in the study done by the EPA to be found in regular run-of-the-mill homes that didn't have water damage, and stuff that could be even found from outdoors that comes in, you know, if you open your window, things can come in, versus a category that was found primarily in the water damage building houses. So using that data from the EPA study of over like a thousand homes, Dr. Shoemaker was able to compare that with his patient's data and using this, he's um, used it now as a health index for patients' homes. I will warn you, it is not the end-all be-all because you can have a great ERMI score and you might still have a problem in your home. So just because your ERMI score looks great, don't let that give you false security. Just be really vigilant. If you're smelling odors, get an inspector to come out and take a look. And the ERMI is just a piece of the puzzle. It looks at different proportions of water saturation levels within the home. So some molds like to grow at really, really wet saturation points. So stachyboitrus and um, chitomium globosum. They're, they make really sticky toxins too. They grow under a bathtub that's leaking. Or I had a, if you had a major flood, you could get stacky boisterous from that. Medium wet conditions can have different species growing, including Aspergillus and Versicolor and Pensiloides. And then the dry wet conditions would be like, think about your heating ducts. You wouldn't typically think that mold could grow in your HVAC system. But there is a species of mold that likes to be there. It's called Wallemia sebi. And so we have all these various areas in the home that this is a great screening tool to see 
and kind of generally pinpoint if there is an issue. It's, um, the other thing is some patients will get VCS abnormalities. I don't know if all of you have had a VCS test, but it's a visual contrast sensitivity test. And what we do is we first check how good you can see um, with a regular vision screening. So if you're 2020, 2030, 2040, um, people who are 2040 or better, going down to 2020 or even like 2010, can con proceed on to the VCS test. But if you're 2050 or worse, then the VCS test won't be accurate for you. We can test just one eye if you only have one good eye, and that's fine. It's better to have both eyes being able to be tested. Um, but this test, which is called the visual contrast sensitivity test, is then performed, and it's a series of circles that have little wavy lines in them. And the wavy lines get kind of dimmer, and depending on which column you're on, they get tighter. Okay, so what it helps us to see is your eye's ability to see a fine edge and to distinguish between white and black. And what Dr. Shoemaker found with all of this research on these patients from various biotoxin illnesses is that a lot of them had abnormal VCS testing where they couldn't see the wavy line or the distinction between black and white at a certain point compared to people who didn't have the syndrome. And so we use that data to um, um, all the Shoemaker docs who are using this protocol, use that data to help guide and direct treatment as well as help aid in the diagnosis. 8% of patients who have SIRS have a normal VCS test. 92% of patients with SIRS are abnormal. So if you come in and you get a normal test, it doesn't mean you don't have SIRS. But if you have an abnormal test, it's very helpful to point towards SIRS. Also, always bring your reading glasses with you for the testing or corrective lenses for reading because otherwise it'll throw off the results. I've had that be an issue too. Most of the patients responded to the cholesteramine and they had improvements. And I've seen this time and time again where the VCS test over time starts to improve. Even if you have a normal VCS test in the beginning, if you're not 100%, which most people aren't, you know, seeing nine out of nine and everything, most people can't, you'll typically see improvement in that E column. It'll start to go up. And a lot of patients, when they start this out, they can't see anything in the E column, even though they passed the VCS test. Um, my experience is I could barely see anything in the E column. And then when I was at the peak of getting really well, I was almost to the very top in the E column. So it really does over time show how the toxin is being removed. The toxin is directly impacting your, visual, your vision area um, for, not for reading a piece of paper, not for reading a road sign, but for this contrast sensitivity, difference between white and black and the curving fine edge, okay? So I'm glad that they found something that was non-invasive and relatively cheap to do. So when you take the medication, you're either going to take Wellcol, which you would take with food, or cholesteramine, which you take about 30 minutes before meals. The cholesteramine is the, the best one to use because it has more binding sites to it than the Wellcol. But not everybody can tolerate the cholesteramine because it causes a lot of intestinal upset for some patients, and it can predispose to getting constipated. So if you're going to take cholesteramine, what you have to understand is the importance of the timing of the medication with your food and the type of food you eat. The reason is, when you take the cholesteramine 30 minutes before a meal, it's gonna make its way all the way to the spot in your intestinal tract where the bile gets excreted within about 30 minutes. So it's kind of like landing right in the playing field where you want it to be. And then you eat a fatty meal, say, you know, you have a little bit of coconut oil with your breakfast or butter or whatever kind of fat. That fat is going to stimulate your body to secrete the bile that's in your liver that has the toxins in it. So when you eat the food, your body sends a hormone to your gallbladder to squeeze out some of that bile that has the toxins in it. And the bile goes right into the cholesteramine. And the bile has the toxins and the cholesteramine acts on the, on the biotoxin. So the cholesteramine is positive charged 
and the biotoxin is a negative charge. And so they attract to each other. And the cholesteramine has just the right fit, kind of like a ball. The toxin is the ball, and the cholesteramine is the glove, and it just pulls it into the stool and you excrete it. So the importance of the distance between the medication and your food is very critical. Also, cholesteramine likes to mop up other things. So when I say mop up, I mean other medications or supplements you're taking. It could try to you know, mop those things up as well because it's a binder. So you'll have to talk with your doctor and be in concert about those things. The one of note that's very important is the thyroid hormone replacement. Typically that would need to be given the first thing in the morning. And then the cholesteramine or the well call needs to be distanced further in the day. And your doctor can talk to you more about that. But that one seems to come up quite a bit as an issue.